much for being here. Um, welcome to ASU's Humanities Week. For those of you joining us on the live stream, my name is Matt Bell. I'm an Associate Professor of Creative Writing here in the English Department at ASU. It's my pleasure today to welcome you to my English 307 Writing Science Fiction class focused on world building in science fiction and fantasy, which today has a great honor of talking with Dr. Nettie Okorafor, best-selling award-winning author and new professor of practice here at ASU. Um, before I introduce our guest, I'd just like to say a few words about the class you're visiting. Um, this is the second year I've taught this course, uh, which is designed uh, to be a bigger, more inclusive gathering than usual in creative writing. There are 38 students in this course, about half of which are creative writing or literature majors here in the English department, the rest coming from other parts of the university. There are filmmaking and theater majors, students from psychology and history and philosophy, business, digital culture, the sciences, and other areas. Um, as such, each student brings a different kind of knowledge and skills to the course and to the imagined worlds they create here. Um, in this course, we read six science fiction and fantasy novels together, studying them for the writing craft and their ideas about our past and present and our possible futures. Uh, in addition, each week, every student writes a short piece of fiction that builds out one part of their invented world, a place they'll spend the semester imagining. They draw maps, create protagonists, design magic systems, invent technologies, plan governments and economic systems, discover ecosystems, um, and so much else. Um, this is one of the most fun classes that I, I teach here, and also one where I think the student excitement and success is visible in every meeting. I can't tell you how much enthusiasm the students in this class have for the worlds they're making and the ones their classmates bring to share. In making these worlds together, they are imagining and sharing other ways of being and dwelling, grounded in their own interests and experiences, reaching toward their desires for the futures they want to make. Um, all of which brings us to our guest and the reason you're likely watching this too. Um, our third novel this semester was Nettie Okorafor's 2014 novel, Lagoon, a work of African futurist science fiction, set in Lagos, Nigeria, uh, primarily following three characters, Adora, a marine biologist, Anthony, a rapper, and Agu, a soldier, who make first contact with a shape-shifting alien who shift lands in the lagoon that gives Lagos his name. It's a surprising polyphonic work of fiction told in many voices, including the voices of animals and folkloric characters. Uh, by the end of the novel, it lays out a possible vision of a new future for the human and non-human inhabitants of Nigeria and the world. Um, and then just to give uh, Dr. Korfor's full bio, Nnedi Okorfor is a Nigerian-American author of African-based science fiction, fantasy and magical realism for children and adults. Her works include Who Fears Death, currently in development at HBO, the Binti Novella Trilogy, The Book of Phoenix, The Akata Books, and The Goon. She is the winner of Hugo Nebula World Fantasy Locus and Lowstar Awards, an Eisner Award nominee, and her debut novel, Azara the Windseeker, won the prestigious Wole Shoinka Award, I'm sorry, Shoinka Prize for Literature. Um, Nettie has also written comics for Marvel, including Back Black Panther, Long Live the King, Wakanda Forever, and the Shuri series. Um, we're so lucky to have her here with us today. Thank you so much for joining us, Nettie. Happy to be here. Happy to be here. Thank you. Um, at, you know, as I, as I said before we started, students are going to ask most of the questions today. Um, but just to, to sort of let us settle in, um, I thought I would just ask about, uh, about Lagoon, since that's the, the book we read for class. Um, where did the novel begin for you? What was the sort of initial inspiration for Lagoon and where did it go from there? Yeah, it's interesting. Okay, so Lagoon was kind of inspired by my reaction to the film District 9. Um, District 9 came out, I can't remember when now, but um, yeah, so District 9 came out and I remember seeing the trailer and I was so, so excited about that film. I was like, oh my God, it's set in South Africa. It's, it's, it's about aliens coming to that part of South Africa. And it's like, it's all very specific. And so I was really, really excited. And, and uh, <laughs> I was really, really excited. And, um, hold on, okay, yeah. <laughs> Cats are something else. <laughs> something else. Yeah. Um, Anna, can you handle that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I was really excited and I went with my sisters and they were all really excited as well. And so we see this film and uh, our grins slowly got smaller and smaller and smaller as the film progressed. And so like District 9 was just basically full of a lot of, it had a lot of issues. And I, I ended up writing a blog post that is still up 
on my blog, which I rarely write on now because I'm too busy. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, I ended up writing about it. So like, if you're curious about what my views were on it, it it's all there. I documented it all there. And so like my whole vibe with that was it really focused on the, the portrayal of Nigerians in, in that film. They were, they were called the Nigerians. They were, it was very stereotypical. It was very problematic. Mm -hmm. It was very connected to a lot of issues that are, were happening in South Africa that I feel like the filmmaker, the, um, the director was like not aware of the issues that he was putting in there. But yeah, so, so that negative experience with District 9 kind of caused me to start really thinking about, okay, so this film did a bad, a poor job with it, but I, I was like, okay, so what would it be like if, if um, aliens were to land in Nigeria? Like how would Nigerians respond to, to aliens? And so like once I, once I dealt with that, what if, that what if mm -hmm. aliens landed in Nigeria, everything else kind of, the whole story just basically almost told itself because like when you ask what if aliens landed in Nigeria, the first thing you think is, oh, they'd land in Lagos. <laughs> like, that would be the first place they would land. It's like the, the it is the, the biggest city in, in Africa is the biggest city, of course, in Nigeria. I've been there, it's insane, like in a good and not so good way. I know Lagos very well. And I'm like, oh yeah, aliens would totally go there. And, and then what a story that would be. And then I could see, and then like just the whole, you know, the, the way that the narrative was told just kind of fell into place. But that was the, the inspiration was seeing that film. And then, and I was talking, after the film came out, I remember talking to a, Nollywood is Nigeria's film industry, which is the second biggest film industry in the world. The first is Bollywood. Hollywood is the third. Mm. So I was speaking to a, a, um, a Nollywood director and I was talking to him about like science fiction and, and why don't they do more science fiction narratives? And then we got to talking about just African science fiction and what does that mean and, and what, how would it be different and why is there so little of it done? So it just, it was like a whole, it was a whole thing that inspired, inspired Lagoon. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. And we talked a lot about like how so much of science fiction is like a response to another piece of science fiction that seems so sort of, you know, often happens. And I appreciate uh, the way yours is here too. Um, well, great. I think I want to open it up to the students. Uh, would someone like to ask a, a first question? Uh, Max, I can see you with your hand raised. Uh, go ahead. Um, so you just explained the inspiration behind the book. Something I thought was interesting was how it combined two very different aspects of science fiction, sea monsters. Well, okay, that'd probably fall under fantasy and aliens. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm very interested in what made you want to, again, if you answered that, I apologize. I'm just curious what made you want to um, combine those two different kinds of monsters. That's a very interesting co uh, combination, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was all, it was all, uh... The, it, it started with the question of when I started asking the question of aliens in what would alien what would it be like if aliens were to land in Nigeria, right? So when, once I settled on the city of Lagos, Lagos is right on the coast, right? It's it's right on the water. So water, water was definitely going to be a big a big part of the story. But also another question that I was thinking about was what it, this was before I came up with the term um, African futurism because like. This, this definition and these things were what led to the definition of African futurism. So I started thinking about, okay, so you've got science fiction and what does it mean for, I've always felt that science fiction, the, the, the general definition of science fiction is very Western. It does not have room for different point, uh, world views, right? So like in some parts of the world, like Western part of the world, Westerners tend to see the mystical world and the mundane world is separate. You go to the mystical world. They're not commingled, but other cultures view these things as commingled, you know? So like your general point of view, your, your reality is that there are mystical things that can happen around you. That is normal. That is reality. That is, um, when you say realism, that's what they're talking about, that there are mystical things that can happen within our mundane. So I'm like, okay, so when we're talking about science fiction from an African perspective, that would mean, because most African cultures, and I'm generalizing here, and usually when I'm talking about African, in this case, I'm speaking about West African, you know, I'm Nigerian, I'm Igbo, so it's very specific. But if I were to, if, if I were to look at their iteration of science fiction, 
it would include the mystical. Like that would be part of it. It wouldn't be like, if, if they were to say, this is science fiction and there were mystical things happening, they wouldn't say, oh, this is science fiction with fantastical elements. This is just science fiction with, you know, so like once I started thinking about that, that's where Lagoon came from. Lagoon came out of me wanting to explore that definition of what is African science fiction, really? What would tr true African science fiction be? And it would not be this idea of hard science fiction, which does not have any mystical elements. If we're talking about culture, making sure that the cultural aspect is included, then there are going to be mystical things. So you've got Lagoon, where you've got, um, when the aliens come, they don't just meet the human beings. They meet the animals, they meet the spirits, they meet the gods and the deities. That's all part of this idea of what is African science fiction. And then like you're asking about the, the monsters and the sea creatures, I'm fascinated by the ocean. I'm, I'm fascinated by what goes on in there that, you know, that we're not, you know, humanity is not always privy to. Even in the shallows, there are things happening that <laughs> we don't know. And I, I'm fascinated by that. And so the idea of aliens coming and they make, they first make contact with the sea creatures. It's not human beings, the sea creatures. And so there's that back and forth and they, those becoming like a, a major part, major part of the narrative. That's where that, where all of that comes in. It's, it's also my fascination with, with the, um, with the, with the, this, with the sea, with the ocean, and also the fact of where Lagos is located, it's very much a part of the ocean. There are lots of aspects where it's um, the, for example, when they when they find the uh, the the way, the beached whale that that you know is kind of that ends up on the beach because it, because of the aliens that was taken from real. Like there's so much that was real. Like that was real. You can find the footage. I took some of the dialogue from the footage of a whale that beached in Lagos and how people reacted. So like, I was just weaving in a lot of things, but that's where, where all of that comes from. There's so much, um, so much that I put into, to Lagoon that comes from multiple areas, but I, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, no, it does. It's yeah. That kind of reminds me of a character, something I created where I decided it'd be fun to try to mash horror with noir. So that's, that's kind of what that makes me think of personally, just the idea of taking aspects of what you're writing about and just combining them to tell a brand new type of genre. Yeah. Thank you, Max. Um, I know, I know Alex had his hand up and then Riz, I'll come to you and then we'll get some more hands. Uh, Alex, go ahead. Thanks, Max. Uh, hi, thank you. Um, hi, my name is Alexander. Um, uh, I'm a psych student at ASU currently. And one thing that really struck me about kind of, uh, your writing is it seeing you reach into your culture and like experiences for inspiration and stories has been really kind of great for me to see because again usually a lot of the uh <laughs> a lot of science fiction authors are uh, old white men um and i've spent a lot of my life feeling some kind of way about being a uh, mixed race uh, mixed person white and filipino not feeling like i have a home uh, or like a culture to rely on um so uh i guess my question is, I, I've been having like trouble kind of, uh, trying, sorry, I'm like all over the place. Um, I've been having, I, I'm curious about how you organize uh, your like stories and like process them to co coherent plot line and world. Uh, did you, uh, was it more of like a feel through process or was there like internal code slash key uh, that you run ideas through or is it just kind of you built the world and everything else came with it. Yeah. Um, gosh, there are so many things I want to address. Uh, first one is like when it comes to having a like when it comes to like the cultural stuff. Um, and I just want to say this, even though you didn't ask this, but I want to say this anyway. Just you don't need to see something exist before you can make it exist. So I just remember that. Like you don't need like you, you don't need because there's so many things that I've written where like I'd never seen them before and that didn't stop me. So like, if you've never seen it before, you just make it exist. That's, that's your job, make it exist. So, um, but in terms of plots and, and storyline, like the way that I, the way that I write is kind of weird. It's, it's, I'm, I'm just gonna, it's kind of weird. 
um, I've been writing for a long time. The first, I started writing as, a, as a, an undergrad. Like I started writing as a sophomore in a creative writing class. I'd never written anything creatively before that, even though I read a lot. Um, but once I started writing, once I took that creative writing class and wrote that first story, I knew I found what I loved. Like I knew it. It was like, just love, oh my God. So I've been writing for a long time. And when I first started writing, I wrote for about eight years without anyone reading anything. Like maybe in my creative writing class, but I was writing outside of class and I was not workshopping those things that I was writing. I was just writing. I was just writing because I love doing this thing. And so because I had that isolated time, I didn't have anyone like looking over my shoulder or telling me how to do this thing or judging anything that I was doing. Like I was just, I was experimenting, I was seeing what worked, seeing what didn't work and all that. So because I had that, and it's, you know, that, that isolated time, I was able to really find my voice and find what worked for me. Okay, so I, I preface what I'm saying because of what I'm about to say. Because my writing, um, the way that I that I come up with story is weird. It's not, and, and it's also from from doing this for so many years. And when I, it's like I'm not exactly that old or whatever. But like I've been writing nonstop since I started writing that 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 first story. I've been writing nonstop, like nonstop. I love writing, and I, I wrote like five novels before my first novel was published. And I'm talking about like full blown, over 500 pages, edited, you know, all of that. So like, it's just something I've done over and over and over and over again through practice. So the way that I write now, like I don't outline, I don't, um, I'm not, I'm like what they call a pantser. So I'll just sit down and start writing something. With Lagoon, the first part of that story that I got, and I don't write linearly. I write complete, like inside out, like I could write the middle and then I'll write the end and I won't even know where it's going. I'll just know, I'll just have an idea. Like, I just know that there's a story and I'm just going to keep doing it, you know? So I just keep going. And each time I write a, a, a scene, then another scene will become like really clear. And then I'll write that scene. And then another scene will become clear and I'll write that scene, jump around, jump around. And then at the end, I bring it all together. And that's what I edit over and over and over again. With Lagoon, I wrote the first, the first thing that I did write was Moom, the, the beginning with the swordfish. Like, I just knew, like, I just knew. I, I had heard a story about a swordfish that kept attacking an oil pipeline. And I'm like, I want to immortalize that swordfish. I just want to. And so I wrote this short thing about it. And then like, by the time I finished it, I'm like, oh. And then I think I wrote the, the tarantula scene next. And then I think I wrote the, um, the, the initial scene where they get taken and then I jumped to the bat. So it was like, I just was jumping around. It was just, I didn't know what I was writing. So I just, but I just, I've come, because I've done this so much, like over and over again, I've come to trust the process. And I don't, like, I'm not like, oh God, I have no idea what happens next. I'm gonna start stressing out about it. I don't stress out, I just, I just relax and it always comes. But that's, that's really my process. And, and so because I write like that, I, my editing process is really intense because it's a mess. You know, the first draft is a mess. It's full of typos. I don't go over anything. I'm very just bleh, throw it on the page. And then the editing and editing and editing is what takes a very, very long time. So like I, in terms of like um, having ideas, like uh, in terms of plotting and, and what I'm writing about, I do do research, but it's not in an organized fashion. Nothing I do is in an organized fashion. It's very, everything is very chaotic, but I understand the, what's going on, if that, if that makes sense. And I'm very, like, I'm also always interested in stuff. So I'm always kind of researching things and those things kind of eventually make it into what I'm writing somehow, even though I don't know at the time. Yeah. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah, thank no, you, Freddie. Thank you. I'm sorry, Alex. Go ahead, please. Oh no, I was just saying thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. It's it's good that we talk so much about this sort of outside in, inside out, pantser kind of stuff. It's good for them to to know where yours, how yours are made too. Um, I see a couple of hands up, so we we'll go Riz, Christopher, Paula, and Bree. Uh, Riz, take it away. All right, great. Thanks for being with us, Nettie. Uh, I'm Riz, and I'm a PhD student here at ASU. My question is about your path to publication. Uh -huh. And did you experience any pushback, you know, given the kind of non-Western-centric view of the novel, but also like 
with the pigeon and the language and the way that you didn't necessarily explain things that you know Western novel might expect them to be explained you know about a particular culture. And so I'm just wondering, you know, what that was like for you with this, either with this novel, Nagoon, or with your first novel, and, and whether they pushed back or you know was that easy or difficult. Yeah, that's that's actually a great question. Um, so Lagoon, can't remember what number novel it was, but Lagoon was pretty far along. Was it before? Yeah, it was before Binti, but it, it's still, you know, I, I'd had several things published by then, and I, I, you know, my name was was kind of known by the time Lagoon came out. And the thing, but I will say this: Lagoon has had a very of, of, not of all my books, but like, cause several of my book, novels have had a rough path. Lagoon had a rough path in a strange way because when I wrote it and I knew when I wrote it, I, I put the pigeon English in there and I did not like, I, like I'm not gonna translate this. I, I, that was a definite choice where I'm like, I'm not translating this. I'm not making it easier. I'm putting it all in there. And I figured either the reader can go along, you know, the reader can figure it out. They figured out, you know, Klingon and, and what is it, the uh, <laughs> Lord of the Rings, the, the elf, like they, the readers, uh, science fiction and fantasy readers have learned languages before. So I figured then this is close to English. You can figure it out if you just relax your ear, just relax. So I knew that. So I, so when I, when I wrote it, I put it in there and I was not like, and, but I did break it up into chapters. So there are only certain characters who speak it. It's not every single character in the book. Um, that was intentional as well, but so when I finished Lagoon and I knew it was different from all my other novels because I like to write in one point of view. It's always, I like to write in a very close point of view. That's my favorite way of writing. Like first person, close point of view. I love that. This was different. This was like more voices than I have ever written before. It was very different. It's a Rashomon effect. You know, we've got one incident where all of these different characters are experiencing that incident in, in different ways from different points of views. It was all over the place. And it was, it was, it was a lot. Lagoon is a lot. And I knew this when I wrote it. So when I, and, and one thing I also tend to do is when I write something, I don't tell my editors, like I don't tell my editors and publishers, okay, I'm writing this. It's usually what I'm writing is usually not on contract. So it's like me showing it to them. I tell them about it. But what I tend to do is I don't tell them about it at all because I don't want them to meddle in anything that I'm writing. And then I tell them about it when it's done. I'd be like, ah, here, <laughs> I wrote this. And so I finished it and I told my editor about it and I used the word, and this is like, never use this word. <laughs> when you're describing your work to your editor, never use it. I said, this is an alien invasion narrative, but it's not commercial. I said that, it's not, and it's not, but, I don't know. She, my editor heard this word and was like, oh, okay, anyway. She just was like, okay, what do you have next? What else? What else? So she just was not interested in it at all, at all. To this day, she regrets it. But um, so she's my main editor, my main publisher for my adult novels. So next thing you know, Lagoon did not have a publisher. And it did not have a publisher for like two years. And, you know, I'm working on this other stuff. and. And those have, have a publisher, like the Book of Phoenix and everything. But then um, a UK publisher was like, they're like, why does not, you know, what, what does Nettie have? I know, I know I heard she had this other thing. And so this UK publisher came sniffing around. They read Lagoon, loved it. So, so my novel was published in the UK first, which is unheard of. Like it's backwards, it's completely backwards. And then uh, Simon and Schuster, learned about Lagoon after it was published in the UK. And this is after the fact, so it's no longer a new novel. And then they published it in the United States, which totally took the wind out of its sails. So if, if Lagoon was published in the usual way, it would have done much better in terms of sales, but it wasn't. So that's what happened with that. But that, that, that's a different story than like, how did I, you know, how did I get published in terms of writing these kinds of narratives where they're African centered where I'm pulling from my culture. And like the way that my first novel was published was really, um, I found the right editor. I, I knew the right editor who was perfect for it. And I found her and my, my agent happened to have gone to high school with that editor. She was at Disney at the time and then she was at Houghton Mifflin. And so that's how she was able to get it in front of that particular editor. So it was like a nice internal thing that happened. And that's how my first book was published through that. 
through that relationship. And I knew that I was writing something that was unique. It was, it was, it was drawing from direct African culture. And like, that was a major part of it. It was science fiction. It was partially fantasy. And I'm talking about Zara the Windseeker here. And when it came, when, and I knew that at the, at the time, this was 2005, that was utterly unheard of, utterly unheard of. So I knew from the beginning that I couldn't take the usual channels. Like I knew that I couldn't just, you know, put it out there, have editors read it and consider it. I, I knew that wasn't going to work. So I, you know, I kind of found, found another way and it was a, it was a successful way. So, and, and, and one last thing, I never thought to myself about the obstacles. The obstacles were a given to me. They were just things to get around. So I was like, it, I didn't think, I didn't go in with a lot of expectations. I wasn't thinking, oh, I want to be a huge best-selling author. How do I do that? I didn't have any expectations. I loved writing and I'd written this thing and I was like, okay, let's see what happens. That was my attitude. So whatever came, there was, I wasn't really disappointed or whatever, because I didn't have any expectations in the first place. So, so yeah, that's really, yeah, that's the journey. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Thank you, Riz. Thank you, Nitty. Uh, Christopher, Paula, Bree, and Ben. Christopher, go ahead. Uh, hello. Hello. Uh, my, my name is Christopher. I'm a philosophy student uh, on my senior year at ASU. Uh, I was very interested in the whole dynamic that the aliens had with the environment of Lagoon. Uh, I was mainly curious about how you came to the idea of uh, the ocean in general, because you probably, like maybe before or maybe even after uh, this idea of how the aliens kind of in like invoke kind of natural evolution that's rapidly like progressed in the environment. Like that whole idea of the environment kind of becoming a factor in a story at such a rapid rate that we don't see in nature typically. Uh, did you ever did you ever think of other biomes that you could have applied the same subject to? Or if not, then why were you interested in the ocean uh, particularly? Is it because you decided the city, like you said before, like, oh, it must be in Lagos? Yeah, yeah, that was mainly, I mean, it's, it's a lot of things. Um, the ocean fascinates me as well, like it fascinates me. So, um, so there was that, and then also with Lagos being right on the ocean, I knew that that would be where it would happen. Um, and it just, I mean, if you've got aliens who are, their technology is the, the ability to manipulate right down to the molecule. You know, that's their tech, that is their technology, which is beyond, oh, basically it's beyond all technology. You know, they can manipulate themselves all the way down to their molecules. So it's like, and then I was like, oh man, what would it be like for aliens to land in the ocean where, gosh, like where you've got like just so much to work with. You've got so much to work with in terms of creatures from the microscopic to the enormous. And then I'm, I was just thinking about all of the, the environmental issues that are happening off of the coast of, of, um, of Nigeria in particular, not necessarily Lagos, but that area. So those environmental issues. And I was like, I'd love to see how like those, just a way to fix it. Like these aliens would fix that. They would not only fix it, they would take it further. So it's like, so that, so that's where that fast evolution comes from and that wish fulfillment as well. Cause I always think about, you know, this, this theme of the creatures being pissed at human beings. You know, you've got the, the swordfish in the beginning is pissed. It's like, why do these dry land creatures keep coming here? Like, leave, you're just causing problems. So like, it was, it was almost like um, just this idea of, of, of uh, doing something for the creatures that we have abused so much, you know? So that wish fulfillment where you've got the octopus that goes in and then gets everything it wants, everything it asks for, you know, and then, and then um, swims off. So, so there's that. Did I consider other, other biomes? Oh, definitely. I thought about the forest, you know, like I, I thought about like the cross river forest in Cal the Cal Calabar region where one, they have the biggest, one of the biggest diversity of butterflies there. <laughs> and I love butterflies. So I was like, ah, oh, there are things I could do with that. But like, if they landed in that forest, can you imagine what those aliens could do there? 
And I considered that. I mean, there is a little bit where, you know, when they come, they, they meet the, 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 the flora as well. Um, I could have done more with that, but it would have gotten so out of control so quickly. But yeah, so I considered, I considered that, I considered that too. But the main reason for the focus is it's, like on, it's Lagos and Lagos is very connected to the water. It's very connected, like just like uh, it, culturally, literally the flooding, like all of that is very connected to the water. So I knew it had to like, I knew that like it would be, they would come from the water. You know, and I, and I love that idea too because I just don't see it. I feel like I don't see it enough in in these in in these alien narratives where because the water already is very mysterious, and for for something even more mysterious to come out of something that's mysterious is terrifying. And I love that. Thank you. Yep. I feel like that's good at writing advice by itself, right? Like something mysterious comes out of something more yeah. mysterious, right? <laughs> just do that. Um, Paula, why don't you uh, ask a question? And Jared, I have you at the end of the queue here too. Yes, thank you. Hi, Nettie. Thank you so much for joining us. I had a lot of fun reading your story, so it's, it's really cool to be able to talk to you. Um, I did want to ask, you mentioned that each of your stories were inspired by your Nigerian heritage and your family trips to Nigeria. What was your favorite tale or experience? And um, has it inspired one of your writings yet? Um, tale of it or experience to um, going to Nigeria or mm -hmm. like in Nigeria? Hmm. Yeah. Um, I think that, oh, there's so many, there's so many. But I think one of my favorites, I'll say one, because then I'll kick myself when I think about this later. Be like, oh, what about that one? But one, it's, like, it's small, but like, it's, it's my, my, Okay, so we've, go, we've been going to Nigeria with, to visit families since a, from a young age, right? And we have these big family trips. And, um, and since, since I was about seven years old. And whenever we would go, we would go either around Easter or Christmas. And whenever we would, we would go, we'd stay in Lagos. And then we would go to the Southeast to my parents' ancestral villages. And those places where, where Lagos was always very modern, you know, skyscrapers, all that. The village was like, is far more rural you'd have like these a lot of people who would who would leave they would also have these really beautiful homes built in these rural areas so you've got these big mansion like homes that are vacant and that have no running water or electricity right so you'd come back and you'd stay in the, the home and clean it up a bit and then sweep it out and then you have a generator for electricity and then you'd have um you know you'd bring in water so we would go and like maybe when I was around 12 or so, um, whenever we would go in particular, yeah, Christmas and Easter, they, they would have the masquerades that would come out. And the masquerades were like manifestations of the ancestors or the spirits, right? And they would be like this, these elaborate, like terrifying costumes. <laughs> like just, I, you just gotta look them up. They're, they're, they can be very, very detailed and huge. And so they would always have the more local ones that would come out around these times. It was always Christmas and Easter, which is really funny considering the religious aspects and contradictions. But so they would come out and they would always like, they'd walk, they would walk down the, the path and there would be a dirt path between the houses and stuff. And they would have like a, a, a whip and they would have a belt, like they would have like boys following them that would be playing these bells to announce that they're coming. And you know they had the whip, and you were supposed to give them money, right? If you didn't have money, you would get whipped. So my sisters and I, we never had any money. <laughs> we never had any money, and like we were the, the American Nigerians, and so they would always target us every time. So like we would just be running all that. You'd see one coming down the street, and he would just take off, and they'd take off after you. And my sisters and I. I, my, I have a younger brother, he's seven years younger, so he didn't experience all of this, but my sisters and I, we were all athletic, so we were fast. So they could never catch us. They would never catch us. And there was this one time where they did, because my oldest sister, she was always in the front, and so we'd be running, and she took a wrong turn. And then we got caught in like this alley, and they whipped us. <laughs> it sounds terrible, but it was fun. It was just... It was ridiculous and funny. I just remember like we were just trying to get behind each other, like ah, it was it was funny. So those are like 
those are some of the fun, um, fun times. And did I use them in my stories? Oh, definitely. I use that in my, my Akata series. Like that whole series is completely peopled with masquerades, like all kinds. Like I have one, the third book in that series is coming out in January and there's so many masquerades in it. It's just like, it, you just, just look them up. They're, they're amazing and they're awesome and terrifying and I'm obsessed with them. And it was really because of those, you know, those, those interact, those initial early on interactions. Yeah. Thank you so much. That's, that's insane. That's so cool. <laughs> it was fun. Thank you, Paula. Uh, Brie, you're up. Hi, Nutty. Um, I'm Brie. I am a poetry major uh, at ASU. Um, my question is kind of related to the last one in a funny way. Um, so one of my favorite parts of Lagoon was the gradual personification of the African deities and spirits throughout the course of the novel um, as Lagos sort of begins to change and react to the aliens. Um, so I was wondering, what was it like combining these older elements of myth with a more contemporary Lagos and finding out how those things interact with one another? like? sort of combining the old and the new. I was just wondering how that worked for you. Yeah, and, and uh, I just remember, yeah, there's a big masquerade in Lagoon, like mm -hmm. a huge one, Ijele. Mm -hmm. like, that is the masquerade of all masquerades. That is the, the one, like, I don't know if you guys looked up what Ijele looks like, just Google it and it's like huge and crazy, <laughs> and very elaborate. Um, but like, yeah, that was a big thing for me, this, that whole idea of, um, I've always loved that theme of the, the ancient and the, and the modern and the new. I love the, the, they're coexisting and they're interacting and they're butting up against each other. And in Lagoon, the way that I did it was with, um, was with Ijele was, was one, I'm, I know there are other ways, but that's the one that comes to mind first. Ijele comes through a computer, like comes mm. through a computer. Like that was intentional because I'm like, I, 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 I see these, um, I don't even want to call them myths because myths implies that they're in the past and they're make believe. Like people believe in these things. Like you don't you don't mess with each other. You don't mess with a masquerade. You don't to unmask a masquerade means you're going to die. Mm. Like to pull the mask off means you are going to die. And you do not don't even try it. So like so Ijele, like I like to think of these things as they're old, you know, and they're they're spirits, but they they coexist now they, they're now and they'll be in the future you know so like i could totally see jelly like, coming through a computer like you know i could totally see that um and 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 like that interaction is not uh it's not it's not impossible it makes sense you know it, it totally makes sense it's, it's 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 um it's something that would happen you know so that's that's really the way I like to bring them together because one of the things like that made me really start thinking about science fiction was seeing the ancient and the modern coexisting, you know, seeing it together and seeing how um, that seeing that they can coexist, like you know that that they can make sense. So like yeah, um, so you, and then and then you've got uh, Legba, who is a is a Legba is a um, a Yoruba deity, uh, the, the Yoruba deity of the crossroads, you know. He's just hanging out at there. He's just hanging out and, and, and one of the characters meets Legba in, in Lagoon. Then you've got Mami Wata, you know, all of them are there. They're all there in this present times. They're, they're all there and they're all meeting an alien, you know? So it's like, you know, I, I just love that idea. I love that idea of, of, of um, they're not something that's of the past. They're not something that's from a long time ago. They are now and they are in the present and they are interacting and they are active. You know, so that's, yeah, that's definitely a theme that I love um, playing with. Okay, Thank so you so much. Thank you, Bree. Uh, ben, you're up. Hi. Uh, first, I wanted to thank you so much for speaking to us. Uh, loved your book, and I'm just so excited to talk to you. Um, side note before I ask my question. Uh, the When you were talking about District 9 earlier, I I really felt that um, I really like fantasy is my wheelhouse and I've been reading a lot more fantasy lately and there's been a lot of times where I'm like that's it's not it's not how it's not how that works yeah. um, 
So I, I absolutely relate to, relate to that being um, a motivation to write something better. Um, but that, that leads me into, I kind of have two questions. Uh, they're related though. Um, when you're incorporating elements of your culture and heritage into your, into your pieces, do you, how consciously do you have to work to do that? Is that something that is very much like you, every page you're rereading it like 15 times trying to make sure you have it exactly right and also do you ever have moments where you're in doubt at, in doubt as a representative of this culture you feel you don't you're you don't want to mischaracterize anything in that even if you're from it yeah okay great question um the the how conscious am i of it is barely conscious at all because that's what i live you know and it's like and I'm, I've always been very clear and probably be, probably because of those of, of my upbringing, because like I had these early trips to Nigeria, right, where, where we were going, um, we we're going there and meeting relatives and interacting and having cultural clashes and arguments and, you know, I'm the American Nigerian, but it's like you, you're not there as a tourist, you're there as family, but you don't speak the language and people are making fun of you and you're arguing back. And also I've, I've always had, like, I've been very, I've always been part of that discussion. I've always been ready for that discussion. And I've, and I've been honest about it. Like I never went there to try to be someone else. Like I wouldn't try to put on an accent or whatever. Like I, I've always been very clear that this is who I am. At the same time, I'm, you know, uh, raised in, in um, the South suburbs of Chicago, you know, in a neighborhood that was Predominant, well, that was all white when we moved in and had to deal with massive amounts of racism. Once again, lucky that we were fast because we were running in a different way, you know, from racist kids calling us the N-word and like older kids. So we had to deal with that. So it's like, I've always been in dialogue, um, openly in dialogue with these issues and with who I am. And I haven't questioned, like, it's not, I've always been clear. So like, even when you know, where I get something wrong, I'm ready to admit, okay, I got that wrong. Let me figure out how to get this right, you know? So it's always been some a dialogue that I've, um, that I've been open with. And I've always been clear in who I am, you know, and what standpoint I'm coming from. I've always been clear in that. So when I started writing, it was effortless, you know? So I'm like, okay, I can write this thing set in Nigeria. I know exactly what these are. I've listened, I, I, I get this. And I know that, oh, I'm Nigerian American. So I look at things from a different point of view on that thing. Like when I look at these masquerades, I'm not seeing something that I should be completely afraid of and never touch. I see something that I'm fascinated by and I want to go in deeper with those things. Like if I were, if I were, um, if I were Nigerian, Nigerian, I would not have written a, the Akata Witch series with all of that stuff in it or who fears death, like all of that stuff. Lagoon, I would have been, a, you know, I would have been a little more afraid of, of touching some of those things. Mami Wata, especially, I would have been afraid of that. But like, because I have that distance being Nigerian American, you know, I'm not afraid of that. I'm more curious. So it's like, I'm, I'm very clear on, on where all of that's coming from. So when I sit down to write it, there's a confidence that comes with it. And, you know, I've been, you know, I've been, yelled at how many times <laughs> and then told that I was wrong how many times. So like, I'm ready to be called wrong about stuff. It's not something that I'm afraid of, of, of happening. Um, what was the second question? Uh, what was your second question? Did I, did I touch it or? Uh, yeah, I feel like you touched on it. It was okay. about, um, do you, are you ever worried about misrepresenting the group you're a part of? And yeah. Like yeah. That, that. It's, it's, it's and I think that it's important to get it right. It is important. And, and like, as, as writers, writers should always do, of course, do, do the research, but not just the research. It's also going and, um, and trying to, if you're writing about a culture that is like, that is not your own or you're, you're slightly outside of or whatever, make sure you find a way to touch the culture. Like literally, not just research, not just reading. Like you got to find a way. If you're go, you go to a restaurant, you can go and you know there there are all kinds of ways to do that. But you have to touch, um, you have to touch the culture in some way. And 
And then once you've done that, you have to still write with confidence. That's the hard thing. Because you can tell when someone's not confident and they're writing about something that they don't feel good about. Um, yeah, yeah. OK, thank you very much. Yep. Thanks, Ben. Uh, Jared, you're up. And then we'll, uh, then Louise. All right. Hi, I am. I'm Jared. Uh, sorry for any background noise. I'm in the union right now. Um, I just want to quickly reiterate what everybody else has been saying. It's so helpful to have authors come in here and talk to us about this kind of stuff because it becomes the inspiration to how we, we write our stories. Um, so I have a two pronged question for you, one that relates to your novel and then one that relates more to your just general work. Um, first off, is there any scenes or any concepts in Lagoon that you had to cut for time or for whatever reason that you wish that you could have uh, implemented? What was that? Why did you cut it? If there were any. Um, and further along that, that same line of thought, if you cut things from your narratives, do you hold on to them for later projects or do you, do you use them or you just scrap them? What's the process with that? Or do you, have you had experience with that before? And, brought ideas from one book to another, or do you just leave them where they are and let them kind of just, you know, result in themselves? Yeah, that's a really good process question. Um, with Lagoon, nothing was cut. Lagoon, that's one of the best things about writing novels as opposed to screenplays, for example. <laughs> um, <laughs> you can throw everything in there that needs to be in there. You don't have to worry about length in that regard. Of course, I like to write lean. I like to write, not that I like to write short, even though a lot of my works keep getting called short. And <laughs> people are like, this is perfect, but it was short. This is a short novel. I'm like, okay. But like, uh, I like to write <laughs> lean. I don't like fat on there. So, like, everything, I, like I said, the first where I really learned, um, learned storytelling was in a short story writing class. Okay, and the thing with short stories, what I love about short stories is everything in a short story has a purpose. There's a reason for every single aspect to it. There's no room for fluff and tangents. And I love that, right? So I, that's how I ended up writing. Like when I write novels, that's how I write novels. You know, they're like, I like lean where there's no, there's no fat on it. Not at all. So like even my, even my prose is lean. I'm not a flowery writer. I like to, oh, the words that are there are the words that need to be there. And like, I like to have strong words as opposed to many weak words. That's the thing for me, and especially over time. Um, so with, but with Lagoon, that's, that's how long the story was going to be. You know, that, that was it. I didn't have to cut, um, I, don't, I don't recall cutting any scenes from, from Lagoon. Like, that's all of it. But I have written things where I've had to cut. And one of the things, okay, so there's there's a thing of, like when you have to cut a scene, a lot of times you're attached to that scene, you're like, oh, this is great, it doesn't fit here. Um, just cut it and put it in a different file. So it's not gone. That's like, like that just makes, for me, it makes me feel so much better even if I have to cut something big. So the biggest one that I've had to do was my, I had a novella that came out in January called Remote Control. So Remote Control is a novella. Remote Control originally was a novel, like a full-blown novel. And I have never done this. This is the only time I've ever done this where I wrote this novel and I knew it wasn't working. I'm like, this isn't working. It's great, but it's not working. I love the first half. I love the second half, but it's not working. And I knew it wasn't. And that's why it took so long because I actually wrote most of Remote Control um, several years ago. It's like over like six or seven years ago. And I had been editing it since. My editor tried to help me with it. It just wasn't working. And then one day I put it aside and was working on other stuff, right? Because I think I wrote Remote Control before I wrote the Book of Phoenix. <laughs> it's just like, wait, that was a while ago. So, um, and then one day I just woke up. Like, like seriously, I literally woke up. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I know why it's not working. And so then I went to my computer and I went to the file and highlighted the whole second half. I know exactly where it changes. Highlighted that whole half and took that out and put it in a different file. And that, that half that I took out, the, 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 the half that I took out is out. The, the, what, the part that remained is the novella. Like it, I literally wrote two stories 
and attached them at like a, the halfway point was a different story from then on, completely different story. And can you imagine writing something like that and then realizing that you have to cut half of the thing you wrote? Like that was like how many hundred, like 200, I'm like, oh my God, I had to, but then, you know, enough time passed where I was just like, let me do this and I could do it. And it was painful, but I still have the second half and the second half could be its own novella. If I had time, I could just shave it a little bit and polish up the first half and it's another novella. But yeah, so it's like, okay, you're going, all right. Um, but yeah, so it's like knowing when you need to do that is a big thing. Like knowing when it's hard, um, but you know, it's, it's, if you don't focus so much, cause I, I know there's this focus on how long a novel is and it's like, oh, it's a big novel. It must be better. And all that. If you don't focus on that, you focus on the story. What makes the story good? You would be eventually okay writing a 400, 500 page novel and realizing it's a short story and you just cut out the short story and that's what you have. No. Yeah, the, the process can be very, yeah. it can happen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. That's so interesting to hear. I really liked Remote Control, but I didn't realize that was the sort of path to its its publication. Yeah. That's so exciting to hear. Um, we're, we're coming down to the end. So Louise has a question and I know Nico has her hand up and hasn't got to go yet. So bring in Nico after that and, uh, and we'll see where we're at. Uh, Louise, go ahead. Um, we spoke a lot about your novel work we also have um a career in comic books that i've i've actually read a lot of them without even knowing that it was you um how do you even begin to enter yourself as an author into such an established mm -hmm. series like black panther has been around for longer than any of us have been born yeah yeah it's like um one thing that i've learned is that well i, I love learning so like i have two masters and a phd right so clearly i love learning <laughs> And, and like one of the biggest things that I learned through that is, is how to learn, like how to keep learning and, 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 and what that process is like. So, and I, I love, I, not only do I love learning, I love learning different types of writing. Okay. So like, and I, and I've learned also how to compartmentalize. So novel writing is over here. Writing comics is a completely different process. It's completely different. Um, it's, it's more, it's collaborative, but I mean, there are parts of it where like when I, when I write for, um, oh, I'm learning another type of, but like, so I've written, I've written Shuri, I've written um, T'Challa from Black, Pan Black Panther, I've written the Dora Milaje. Um, and in the, in, one thing I can tell you about Marvel, writing for Marvel is their process is very fast, very, very fast. You do not have a lot of time to sit and, and think, you know, I, so you learn, you learn how to like with novel writing, you can take your time, you can spread out, you can redo this and, and mess around with that and, and whatever with, with comics in particular, Mar I'll speak directly about Marvel because I have my own graphic novel as well, which is a completely different process. But with Marvel, like you learn, okay, you've got, um, okay. So you, you've agreed to do this thing, right? And they don't give you a story, at least for me, they don't give you a story. You've got a, a certain amount of time to come up with this, an, an outline, right? They want a, a summary of the story, right? So they, they'll tell you this um, for, for, the, for the Dora Milaje thing. They're like, okay, we want it to be about the Dora Milaje. We need, it's, gonna, it's going to be three issues. It's going to be, I think it was like 21 pages or something like each, ep, each, each issue was 21 pages. And so in the first one, you want Spider-Man. In the second one, you want, um, you want the X-Men. And then the third, you want the Avengers and you want it to be progressive. So Spider-Man will be in the second and the third. And then the, event, the, uh, uh, the X-Men will be in, this, in the third. So it's like progressive. So you're gonna have more and more superheroes each time, right? So then you have like a week to come up with the summary. Actually, I think it was three days. Come up with the summary for the first one and then they okay you, you you do a little back and forth in the summary but it's really fast next thing you know you've got two weeks to write the whole issue like the write the whole issue and it's like so so it's really fast so you have to be on your game but also the process for me i write the script i write the whole script as, as a matter of fact i'll write it like panel by panel where i put the detail in each panel like what i want in each panel and 
it's just, it's, it's, it's relentless. And um, you learn a lot, you learn a lot. And then you know you're writing these characters that people are, that are very dear to people. And if you mess up, oh my gosh, you're gonna hear like, Oh, even if you don't mess up, you're going to hear it. So it's a lot of, so you've got pressure, you've got short period of time and you've got a different format. It's fascinating. And I, I, I oddly enough, because I like a challenge, I think I like pressure, must even from my tennis day. I just, I enjoy it, <laughs> but yeah, it's a completely different, um, a different process. That is insane. Thank you so yeah. much. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have time for just, just one more question and we have to let Nina get back to her, the rest of her busy life. Uh, Nico, I know you've been waiting. Uh, why don't you uh, uh, ask our last question for the day? Yeah, hi, my name is Nico and I just had uh, one question. So at the very end of your book, you have a scene with three students from Chicago. Why did you include that in the end of it? I thought it was, I just thought it was interesting because like the novel was wrapped up and then all of a sudden like you have like this complete perspective change. So what was kind of like the, what was kind of the reasoning there with that? I thought it was yeah. really good. Yeah. Okay. So, um, it was like, I, I, okay. So like, oh, there's so much I'm trying, I'm remembering it all. When I wrote Lagoon, I was a professor at Chicago state university. And like, those are some of my students. <laughs> those are so I like, it just, it was very meta, you know? So like literally I was writing in, and even the room that that scene takes place in, that was a room. I, I think I would describe it as really warm because there's this room that was really warm on campus. And I, you know, and I put them in it. And I just love the idea of linking what was going on over in Nigeria to the diaspora. Like I wanted it to be understood that others were seeing this and like um, they, they were they were processing it well because they were like, oh, you know, these are African superheroes and all that all the way over there. It, it's like, oh yeah, that would make sense. So I, I just, you know, that that was really um, that was really important important for me. It was that that link happening was really important. And like, also Lagoon, the first iteration of Lagoon was as a screenplay. Like when I first started writing it, it was as a screenplay. And so like I was imagining that last scene as you know at the end of a movie where you think it's done, but there's just a little bit more. I was imagining that being that scene, you know, in the Marvel movies where you watch all the credits and then everything ends and then there's, oh, there's suddenly more happening. It was, it was that, that's what that was. So it was more of a, that format, that screenplay format that kind of leaked in there. But also I wanted to make that connection to the rest of the, the, rest of the world of this is what's happening over here, but there's, there's a connection still. All right, thank you very much. Yep, yep. Thank you, Nico. Nettie, thank you so much for, for being with us today. And thank you, everybody in class, for your questions. This is such a fantastic conversation. Uh, I know it's always weird to sort of clap in, in Zoom, but please do. And uh, feel free to enthuse in the uh, the chat. I'm going to uh, stop the recording in the live stream here. Um, but thank you again, Nettie. And uh, so, uh, such a pleasure to have you with us today. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me.